Hey everybody, it's Derek Colbartin from CodeOpinion.com. A lot of the systems that we're building are really just managing workflows and life cycles. That's what they're doing. They provide a way to make state transitions from some beginning to some end. The trouble comes along is that kind of business rules change and things evolve over time. And these rules are likely littered, kind of sprinkled all over our code base, including the front end. And the problem there is oftentimes the front end is kind of implying what these rules are based off the state. Here's how we can avoid that. Speaking of state transitions, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So I've created a really simple example just using a toaster. Here's the open API. I'm just going to show there's only only kind of four operations that you can perform. There's a get to get the toaster, and we can see all it's returning is kind of the state which will show that whether it's on or off. And then the strength level, which is some numeric value. We can then turn on um, our toaster. We can optionally provide a strength if we want to when we turn it on, just to kind of set it then. We can actually just uh, set the strength at any given time and we can change it. And then lastly, we can actually turn off the toaster. So it's really just a couple operations Kind of our state transitions is really only two, it's just kind of on and off. Now you've probably integrated with a third party API just like this, reading the documentation, looking at their open API spec, whatever the case may be, you're implementing it, but you're really looking at that documentation and understand, okay, well, here's the operations I need to perform. Maybe there's some state transitions that happen here, but what is appropriate when? When can I call when, where? There's obviously rules behind the scenes that if I call one inappropriately at it, in a time where the state doesn't allow for it, it's gonna return me some type of error. But how do you know all this besides just reading the documentation? You don't, and that's because everything you're doing is at design time. When you're writing the code, you're reading the documentation, you're deciding, okay, this is the order of operations I need to make in these calls. But that is very limiting because now on the API on that server side, if it evolves and kind of changes the workflow of the rules, you also now have to update your client. So looking at these four very simple operations, I've already defined rules around that you can't turn on a toaster that's already on, you can't turn one off that's already off, but you can set the strength at any given time. So if you're developing kind of your client and you're gonna say, okay, well, I know that when I fetch the state, that if the state says on, then I can allow them to turn it off and vice versa. So we're only gonna let them perform the action that we know is gonna be um, operational. That's actually gonna work given the state of the system. So just as a quick example in Postman, if I get the state, I can see we're off with a strength of six. I can then go ahead and turn it on. Now we're on with a strength of six. I could actually just go change the strength. Let's turn it to five. Now we're there. And then I could, if I just fetch it again, we can see, okay, we're on at five. And then I can go and turn it off. And now we're off. But as I mentioned, we can't turn it off again because we're already off. Same thing with on. Okay, we're on now, it's fine, but I can't call it again because we're already on. But what typically happens, as I mentioned, is that we start looking at the state of the system and those responses say, okay, yeah, I can perform this operation, but that's based on design time when you're reading the documentation at that time. That's not to say that it's always gonna be that way. So if you build out your client or your UI based with this knowledge and based on the state, of how you were doing it at design time, that means that your UI might only allow them to turn on the toaster if its current state is off, and vice versa, if it's off, on. As well as I said that in the documentation, it states that you can change the strength level at any given time. So you may always let them do that, but those rules can change. And if they do change, that means that your client's likely gonna be able to think that they can perform some action, then they attempt to do it, and they can't. And this is all pretty trivial for a toaster, but you can often think in your own systems, think about that, about longer workflows, longer life cycles of things that go through multiple state transitions and how you manage that. And a solution to this is just to be explicit because what we were doing before is implying based off the state, based off the documentation at design time, rather we can be explicit at runtime. So here was the old request. We would have to look kind of when we were writing code saying, okay, well, if the state's off, then we can call the turn on operation rather be explicit at runtime so that we can tell it, here's the operations you can perform now given the state of the system. So we can see that we have the operation ID of strength. We have some href with the URI of what that operation is to call it and the same thing to power on. 
This means a couple things. The first is we're being told explicitly what operations we can perform. We're not looking at the state or what any of the data of the system determine that. We're being explicitly told what operations. So we can see, okay, there's this operation ID and we're kind of leveraging both design time and runtime. So if we look at, okay, well, I know what power on is that operation at design time, I could see, oh, power on, here's the actual information about what that request is gonna look like and we'd code it for what power on actually does. But determining kind of in the client, in the UI, when we can perform operations is being dictated explicitly to us. So as a simple example in my really janky UI, we can see I have our toaster and our strength there and just the output. But if we actually look at the code, maybe before we were doing what I was saying is we were looking at the state of this and we're just letting us change the strength at any given time. But that now because we're being explicit, these things can evolve and change. So rather what we might do is instead of looking at this, we may look at, okay, look, let's look at the operations and let's figure out if there's any calls to the actual operation ID of power on. And we can do this instead. We can just check to see, okay, does this operation actually exist? So we can do the exact same thing here. Rather than looking at the state, we can see, okay, can we actually power off? The exact same thing might happen. We don't have a condition right here on the setting of the strength, but that may evolve. We may decide in the back end, you know what? We only want you to change the strength when it's actually powered off. So we could do that. We could say, okay, let's add strength as a part of this condition and let's do that rather than um, just letting it free wide open. So that way, if we decide to change the back end, this will just all work and our UI will be doing what is appropriate given the state of the system that's been dictated to us explicitly. So now when we're driven by the response in the operations, we can see we're off, we can actually set the strength. So I can change this up to five, we can set it. When I actually turn it on, we no longer have the ability to set the strength and we don't even provide our UI or our client the ability to do that. We can turn it back on and everything's visible again, but everything's being explicitly driven by our API's responses. Another side effect of this is what we're providing in those operations was the URI in that href property. So now what we can do is when we power on, we're just looking for that operation. We can actually get the href out of it and that's the URI that we're gonna be calling. Now this has significant at impact because no longer at design time are you looking up and constructing URIs, the server's providing them for you, which also gives you evolvability. And you can keep going with this. You could be providing the HTTP method that's expected, that can evolve. You could be changing the payload and actually be providing of what the API is expected. And it doesn't have to just be necessarily the state of the system. A lot of this can also involve of authorization of the user that's making the request. Does the user, and think about your system, you have different roles. Based on the roles, authorization, do they even have permissions to make that request? If they don't, you, can't, you don't actually even provide them the operation in the response. There's a lot of ways you can take this, but the point of it is being explicit from your API in the responses and guiding your client kind of through those state transitions and the operations that they can perform. And you'll notice that I haven't mentioned REST or Hypermedia this whole time, but I'm gonna have a link to this video in the description, which I've always direct people to all the time. This is from Osbjorn and this is the Nordic APIs from 2016. This is, I always direct people to this video when they wanna think about REST and Hypermedia. It's a great starting point to really get your mind going. And that's what I was trying to do with my video. So again, I'll have a link to this in the description. If you're building large systems and designing APIs and you have some questions that you want answered, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can chat with other software developers about topics like this and software architecture and design. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave them in the comments and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.